Hello, my name's Tom Plender, and I'm a musician and FND campaigner from London in the UK. My condition is FND or functional neurological disorder. Stigma is a huge issue with FND. Um, there are many different aspects to it, and certainly uh, in in my sort of in the last twenty years of being in in hospitals and consulting rooms, I've seen a fair bit of it and experienced a fair bit of it. I think that the the main stigma that you face as an FND patient is the 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 accusation from medical professionals that it's all in your head that you make it up or that you've got some sort of repressed emotional trauma that you're in denial about. Um, the truth about how trauma relates to FND is actually very complex. Um, the old way of looking at it, uh, which is the, the theory that sort of ends up leaving many FND patients stigmatized, is the Freudian idea. And it stems from uh, Freud's book, Studies on Hysteria, uh, that he wrote with Breuer. Um, and one of the problems with this book is that uh, since uh, the opening up of the Freud archive, there's been a lot of new research that's become available, new evidence that shows that Freud actually falsified a lot of the information in this book. And um, many of his uh, so-called hysteria or conversion disorder patients uh, didn't in fact get better as the result of his treatment. Uh, in fact, many of them got worse. So um, the problem with this theory is it's just too simplistic. Um, many FND patients do have psychological trauma, but many don't. And in fact, most of the evidence now is showing that FND is a, a, a brain network disorder. So it's a, a disruption of the normal functioning of brain networks. The other aspect of the stigma that many FND patients face is, is actually uh, relates again to the, the, the theory of hysteria. Um, and it's, it's sort of this idea that women are less rational than men, that they're more emotional. Um, uh, and the idea of this sort of very 19th century idea of the hysterical woman, um, there is, um, in fact, a fair bit of evidence to show that these kinds of biases are still with us. I mean, I was looking at a study from... Uh, 2021 that showed that um, women with chest pain are much more likely to be diagnosed with anxiety than men. So it's, it's clear that women uh, who are suffering from serious heart problems uh, are being misdiagnosed and it's taking, uh, or it's taking longer for them to get a correct diagnosis because of these kinds of biases um, that are still with us, unfortunately, and uh, that really need to be addressed. So it's a mixture of these sort of very old-fashioned ideas, which are quite sexist ideas, and also um, the fact that FND patients have been stigmatized for over a century, largely down uh, to, to, to Freud uh, propagating his uh, hysteria or conversion disorder theory. So these issues do need to be addressed um, because they're just not fit for purpose in the 21st century, particularly given uh, the latest research using fMRI scans um, showing uh, not only uh, disruptions to brain networks, but also there may be underlying biology to FND, alterations to grey and white matter. So it's, it's a very complex condition and it needs to be looked at from a uh, 21st century perspective with a very nuanced uh, view. I think the Women's Brain Project is important because men and women do have different health needs. And I think particularly when you look at a condition like FND, because uh, a certain amount of stigma and sexism is kind of hardwired into the history of the condition, it is very important to look at some of these stereotypes and biases and how they relate to neurological conditions and mental health conditions historically and um, try and address them, uh, for, as I said before, from a, a modern 21st century perspective, where we're thinking more clearly and more scientifically about these kinds of issues. So um, it's, uh, I'm, I'm very glad that I've been asked to talk to the Women's 
uh, brain project about FND and my experience of FND. I think what I'd like more people to understand about mental health conditions and neurological disorders um, is, I think, I think one of the problems that we're facing is that our our medical systems aren't really equipped to deal with the complexity of a lot of these conditions. So one of the problems stems from this uh, splitting of uh, 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 the physical and the psychological. So this, this idea which really stems from uh, Descartes, the 17th century French philosopher, who announced that the, uh, the mind and body are separate. And um, the, the, these kind of ideas that sprang out of the scientific revolution and the Enlightenment, which have been with us for uh, several centuries and, and are kind of the foundation of our medical systems and, and the way we view things culturally, we tend to split things into either physical or psychological, either neurological or psychiatric. And one of the problems is that the brain doesn't really work like that. Um, if you look at, for example, an area of the brain called the insular cortex, um, it has multiple roles. So one of the things it does is it uh, is responsible for emotional processing. It's also responsible for pain processing. It also uh, plays a role in managing movement and motor function. It may also play a role in consciousness in creating our sense of self. So that's one brain area that's doing uh, multiple different things. And I think what a lot of the research into uh, FND is showing is that um, essentially areas of the brain that control pain, movement and emotion are so deeply intertwined that it's very hard to sort of split the brain into the physical versus the psychological. So I think there's an extent to which um, there will have to be a kind of big paradigm shift um, in our thinking um, and, and I think this would be really helpful for many conditions and it, it's possible that we will see greater collaboration between uh, neurology and psychiatry and in, in the 21st century I'd hope we might even see a sort of collapsing of the the two disciplines into each other as time goes on and perhaps looking at things more as brain disorders rather than this kind of full split between what is physical and what is psychological. In terms of giving hope, um, I think there's no doubt that having a, a very severe illness is one of the toughest challenges that you can go through in life, uh, particularly when it stops your life in its tracks, it, it affects your ability to work and earn a living, or even affects your ability just to enjoy life. And I think that um, it, it is enormously challenging. One of the things that helped me was um, there was a quote uh, that I read. Uh, in fact, no, a friend told me about, and it's from Winston Churchill. And the quote is, if you're going through hell, keep going. And I ended up writing it down and pinning it to my fridge. And it kind of got me through a lot of tough times. And I think that's, that's one of the important things is just to keep going and keep hanging on to hope. I think when you've had hope dashed multiple times, as I did, um, and, and many FND patients will, will probably relate to this, in fact, patients with many different conditions will relate to this, um, when your hope has been dashed many times, you, you can end up in a situation where you start thinking maybe there's no point in having hope anymore because it, 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 it all seems so desperate. But I, I think one of the things that helped me a lot was actually something my dad said. Uh, when it was about six years into my illness and I was extremely unwell and, and none of the doctors seemed to know what was wrong with me. And uh, I, I was talking to my dad and I was in a really desperate state and he said, well, look, I know things are really bad and obviously we've seen a lot of doctors and it looks like they haven't got a clue really what, what's wrong with you. And at the moment it looks hopeless, he said, but medical science does move on very quickly and even though we haven't got an answer now the chances are at some point in the future we're going to find a solution and what we've got to do is we've got to keep going and we've got to keep looking and there will be an answer out there and even if it's not here now 
you know, we're, we're going to find it. And I think, in, in fact, my dad turned out to be right. I mean, it took another six years, but eventually I met Professor Edwards, who had been researching FND and uh, was looking at the condition from a different perspective, more as a kind of movement disorder rather than this very outdated Freudian idea. And had in fact developed uh, with a with a physiotherapist who 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 treated me called Glenn Nielsen a a, a different way of approaching FND uh, this this kind of movement retraining approach based on ideas about the brain making predictive errors relating to to movement and motor control. So in fact, my dad was right. Medical science did move on, and it did provide the answer. So I think the important thing is just to keep going, to keep hanging on in there. And keep that faith that even though you haven't found a solution, there is one out there and you will find it, you know, and, and that that's my, the best advice I can give really is just don't give up, you know, keep, keep plugging on, you know.